Welcome to Conversations with Karalia, where we take a nuanced deep dive into all things related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. My name is Karalia, and I'm your host for this journey. I invite you to relax back, open up, and get curious. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share the love. Alrighty, folks. So today on Conversations with Karalia, I'm going to be interviewing Sophia de Fossard. Pretty sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. She is the admin of a Facebook group called Culty Conversations that was started last year by Anka Richter, who wrote Cult Trip, the book that came out last year that talks about uh, Center Point. It also references Gloria Vale, has a little bit on Ista, has some stuff on Agama Yoga in Thailand, and just looking at the nature of cults and what attracts people into cults. I mean, people don't normally know they're getting into a cult when they join a group, a high demand group, as they're called sometimes. Really interesting book, well worth reading. And I first met Sophia through Culty Conversations because I did join that group. And then, of course, I went to Eden Festival. And Eden Festival is held at Hyden Manor. And Hyden Manor has an association with ISTA. I was really curious to see what would happen when I went to Hyden Manor. I was curious to see what it felt like, how the space was held, how it was facilitated, because some of the issues that had been raised around ISTA, which uses Hyden for their trainings, or at least used to, um, and also around Hyden. So there's kind of this convergence as such. And then when I got chatting to Sophia, I was like, you know what, let's get you on the podcast and let's have a chat about all the things. Because Sophia used to be a social worker and she has a really good understanding of group dynamics of the psychology of all the things. Um, so Sophia and I have had a few conversations in the lead up to this conversation. Um, and I'm really curious to see where we go with this and to see her perspective. She's also got a background in yoga. I think she might also be a yoga teacher. I'm not 100% sure. Well, she has trained as a teacher. Um, but we're going to talk about all the things. So stick around for Sophia. Sophia, welcome to Conversations with Karalia. Yoda, thank you so much for having me. Uh, where are you in the world right now? Just so we can kind of locate. Okay, I'm in beautiful West Auckland, which uh, for some of the, you may know that um, Aotearoa North Island has had quite a few floods recently. Mm. Um, we weren't as badly as affected as the East, but at the moment it's beautiful, but still lots of slips and road closures mm. and building works and things like that. Mm. So you are currently one of the admins on Culty Conversations. So I'd love to talk about that. But before we go into that, can you give me a bit of scope? Because you've done a lot of different things and you've got a lot of background related to this. So yeah. where have you been? What have you done? What do you know? <laughs> okay. So yeah, I've kind of got um, sort of sort of similar to you, I guess, have been on the spiritual path for a very long time. And um that has been in the form of um, been teaching yoga for a while and studied quite uh, deeply into yoga, but also been involved in quite a lot of Buddhist groups for a long time as well. And um, did spend a, quite a long time wrecking with the idea of how can I make this into a job or something I can do and then realized I couldn't do it because yeah. I just, it was just too hard. And, and I just, it's, we're all caught up in this capitalist machine and I just didn't want to put my, yeah. that world in there so um in very early in my life I was a project manager in IT which is very corporate and very boring and I there that wasn't spiritually fulfilling for me so I went and did a master's in social work and trained to become a social worker and that was uh, an amazing uh, part of my career I really enjoyed it but um and I was working in the community um, with people uh, mainly in, in mental health and mainly with young people and their families um, but that process in itself completely unpacked a lot of my spiritual um, ideas of how I viewed the world and how I saw the world and it was it, it was quite a reckoning I guess um, mm. but what um, came out of it was uh, my desire that my spiritual practice is now very much focused on 
um, advocacy work and social justice and that sort of thing because I'm able to use my privilege in those spaces and when mm. I say privilege I'm talking about being able to have gone and studied and being born and able-bodied and you know and just being able to have access to resources and Can I just pause you there because I want to yeah. unpack something you said yeah, yeah. you were like yeah. so when you were working doing social work working with mental illness young people and their families yeah. it began to you said something like unpack oh. Yeah, 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 your perspective on reality via spirituality. Let's talk about yeah. that. Oh, uh, that that could be an entire series of podcasts, Carolia. <laughs> well, but, um, let's touch okay. on it at least. Yeah, yeah. I'll just um, the, the the main crux of it because I spent an awful long time pondering it is this, you know, this this idea and concept of that we are all one and we are all one set of consciousness, whether that's in the, you know God or goddesses or whatever it is, but we all have that we're all or buddha nature you know we all have that um and so in our sort of mo modern spiritual but not religious circles there's this idea that we can access that work on it and maybe have some sort of liberation through working with that but when i started working as a social worker and i work with some of our most disadvantaged communities and people, um, I very quickly realized that we are not all one at all. And however much we can fight against it, um, we still exist in this society and it is a capitalist culture in this country. Um, and we have very strong Western ideals and Western, um, I guess, ontology, which I process of thought and how our systems are structured and it is a discriminatory system by its very nature mm -hmm. so and then on the other side of it when I was working you know obviously in my work I had opportunities to work oh. with people who had caused abuse to others and realized very quickly that there are some people that will never ever ever be rehabilitated will never ever understand what they've done mm -hmm. and so this concept of we are all one just went out the window because you can't I could not operate in a system where people who'd been abused by those who had done the abusing and those who had done the abusing simply just were never going to care or at worst going to manipulate the situation to further cause harm there is never going to be a space where those two worlds can exist and coexist so, mm -hmm. um, so which two I, worlds do you mean the that people, and there are people out there, they're in a minority, but people out there who are serious um, manipulators and abusers yeah. and the people that they've harmed or people that they want to harm. Right, okay. So that that kind of started to unpack the sort of, you know, we're all one and we can move together and, and grow together and liberate and all that kind of stuff. It unpacked it an awful lot. Mm. I mean, that makes me wonder though, like, because my understanding of spirituality is that we're all one that points to the fact that what we are is awareness and there is, you know, we're individual drops of awareness, but we've all conditioned beings. We're an expression of yeah. the one. Yeah. So everyone is a different expression, carrying different conditionings, different karma, different patterns, et cetera. And that manifests as, you know, potentially as a perpetrator or whatever's going on. But the, uh, there is still that um, orientation to awareness that that's the oneness but it's got an individual expression and that's always, always very, very different. And where people are on their path is so incredibly different. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you on that one, but we're still, and I do agree that, you know, social constructs are, you know, that they, they well, they're constructs, they're made yeah. by society. But I've met families who have been born into a certain situation that they will never get out of it because of our constructs, no matter how much they want to be liberated in any way, shape or form, society will continue to push them down. We don't really see those people, although they, because but they are on our doorsteps. Like mm. this is the thing that struck me so much. You won't see them at your local meditation group. It's unlikely. Yeah. It's unlikely. No. So, um, and that was, well, how do these people also be included in this without yeah. minimizing their stories or, um, uh kind of by bypassing their story of trauma and pain yeah mm. so a real tricky one mm. yeah it does make me wonder like I know that a lot's been lost um in terms of the way that spirituality particularly the eastern traditions have been implanted or or appropriated in many ways over here in the west yeah and so you know there's a whole piece around serving those who are less privileged 
And I don't think that that service and meeting the less privileged people where they are has necessarily translated into the way that spirituality is practiced in the West. In the West, it seems to be practiced more along the lines of what will it give me? You know, manifestation and, stuff. Yes, absolutely. And also we've, we come from, you know, most of us in the West, we've come from a background of Christianity, not saying we've been, been born into it, but our, our yeah. history is Christian. And there's this idea of the um, deserving poor and the undeserving poor, you know, mm. those who, and, and that those, those are still very prevalent and you can look at it in our sort of welfare systems and things like that, who gets benefit, who doesn't, who gets help with healthcare, who doesn't, you know, these are still, even though we're a secular society here, yeah. it's surprising how deep these things are. And I think a lot of those things are still quite unconscious and mm -hmm. you might, um, when you're working with very, um, with people who've had, you know, generations of trauma and they're not basically doing what you, you, you're expecting them to do, you know, turn up yeah. to appointments and all that kind of stuff and not even talking about colonization and the layers that that puts on things. Um, we, we, it's very easy to start othering people who are in the greatest need, but those ones, that small group who are um, perpetrators or who, you know, have long histories of, and they've had their own histories of trauma. I'm not disregarding yeah. that, but they're just, don't give a fuck enough and enough to yeah. just you know not care about what they're doing these people can exploit those situations or exploit even us who want to um, help them so mm -hmm. it's very um it's a very gray area um yeah so coming into moderating this group um mm, so, so culty conversations yeah culty conversations yeah. um i haven't I've had brushes with cults all my life, but I guess I've, um, as in like, I've got involved in groups and just gone, oh no, this is not for me and out I go. And of course the yoga world is full of it, um, you mm -hmm. know, and there's an awful lot. And I know you've done some work there sort of talking about the abuses and all that kind of stuff in yoga. And that's an ongoing, that's an ongoing discussion. That's not going away. But mm. um, Anki Richter, who wrote the book NZ Cult Watch, she approached me because I was also in another facebook group around um conspiracy theories and kind of trying to especially around the time of the pandemic and trying to um, help discuss them and talk them through she approached me to do this work in the group as an admin and because i have a social work background um and although i'm not a practicing social worker anymore i still draw very um heavily on my experiences there because they were just so useful um what i saw very quickly in the um, culty conversations was a lot of very parallel stories to um, people that have been stuck in uh, situations of domestic violence or very um, difficult families or abusive workspaces where they've you know suffered long-term abuse or gaslighting or whatever you you know all, all mm -hmm. the whole spectrum of it but they're in these organizations where many of them don't have anywhere to go for any kind of real help you know like if mm -hmm. If you suffer, you know, our, our current systems are, are still full of holes and not great. You know, I'm talking about our, you know, our welfare systems or our court systems, judicial systems, that sort of thing. But there are channels, if you know, to in order to, to um, try and get some help or try and get some clarity or, or um, like mediation, for example. I know we want to talk about that later. Um, but when, when you get into these um, spiritual communities, I mean, mm. they're, they're deliberately there because one, the systems failed people. Two, we're still looking for that spiritual connection. Three, we don't want to go into dogmatic religion. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and for that, you know, there are places, it can be amazing places of healing and transformation. I have absolutely no doubt about that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But, and they exist outside these systems. So they don't have, frameworks around them no one wants like a, a body overlooking them that's kind of like ticking off everyone that's the whole point of them being free of that because those bodies can also be very um binding but without that when things do start to go wrong people mm. often find they have nowhere to go and often people try and fix it from the inside and that is also very problematic which we can talk about but i I found the group very, very interesting and coming in as a social worker, just sometimes I'm, it's quite clear to me what's going on or the messages that people are being told or the way that it's been handled by its um, organisers, whether it's mm -hmm. going to be you know, a good outcome or not. And I found that knowledge is being useful. And I think a part of my spiritual practice, and it's certainly not 
confined to just moderating this group but I have had privilege of information and I absolutely do believe with that education just people understanding um, some of the more nuances around human behaviors dynamics of power that sort of thing you yeah. can make more conform, um, informed choices because mm-hmm. there's no reason why I should be the lucky one to get this information and other mm. people should not so and information is free right once it's in my brain I'm happy to pass it on you know Mm -hmm. so when you say can you give a concrete example of what you mean when you're sort of drawing the parallels between what you've seen people coming through abusive situations etc through the social work that you did and then what you're seeing people coming through high demand groups or culty like groups oh yeah yeah definitely let me just have a quick think of something that I can say that's not going to break anyone's yes confidentiality um yeah, so pl- plenty in the domestic violence or family harm sphere. So typically it's called family harm now because um, we understand very well now that um, it's n- simply not about physical violence. It's about yeah. the emotional abuse and the gaslighting and the control and all that kind of stuff. So um, there have been times where I've been working with a person who is uh, trying to get out of an abusive relationship and they may have children involved. Um, and usually if you're going if they're married or if they've been long-term partnership the first place you go is mediation and you can't it's very hard to get straight to family court if you want to get a protection you get protection orders sorry but if you want to get custody of your children because you believe they're in harm it's very hard to go to family court so um, you go to mediation and what I've seen in mediation um, because I'd go along as a supporting role is that some very very um manipulative abusers will basically turn it to say that the mother is or the caregiver who's who's alleged or and this is the other thing it's all alleged when it comes to abuse but um but when it's a a burglary it's it's got a different word you know (laughs) anyway so people say they've been abused um uh they it will get turned on them and like they are crazy they are mad they're not you know that they they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing they have always been a bit unhinged or you know and and this this plays out as well in cults you know when people come or high demand groups people start to feel uncomfortable about um, boundaries being transgressed and again looking at the word abuse I haven't yet found a really good definition of spiritual abuse, but I'm going to say spiritual, sexual, yes. physical, and emotional, because um, the, 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 they're all there. When people start feeling these, that their boundaries being transgressed, or they actually have um, suffered from abuse or been abused or, or whatever, um, the whole process of them trying to call it out almost plays the same part of, uh, you know, same mm. path as when you're dealing with a, a very a strong or um, narcissistic um, partner or, or person who's like ruling the house with an iron fist or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, um, and just, and also how it can dismantle the person um, and that fear of loss. I mean, you don't even have to threaten someone by saying you are going to lose everything. You're going to lose your family. You're going to lose your community. No one will believe you. You're gonna, you, know, you don't even have to say it. We know that that threat is there. Same in domestic relationships. You know, you leave me, you're losing everything. Same in um, often in high demand cults. You know, the stakes are incredibly high, which mm. in turn tends to silence people. Or you can get the other side of it. I was in one mediation with a, a, a family and the, um, the, it was a male that was a perpetrator in this case. And, um, you know, he came out and said, I'm so sorry. I've just had such a tough time in my life. I really want to be a better man and all. <laughs> and he totally, I'd been working with this family for a while and I'd warned the mediators that this is probably the tactic he would take. But of course it was taken and uh, within, you know, the, 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 the children were back in his care and the mother was back in the home and within a short amount of time, the abuse started yeah. all over again. So you've kind of got two dynamics, to, to, you know, to deal with. It's either the flat out denial or the we will change and then nothing mm-hmm. else. But the psychological damage that this causes can be horrific because we all have our trauma journey and mm-hmm. as you know from trauma, it's that drip, 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 drip. You know, you can have, yeah. you know, little bits, little bits, little bits, one big thing, little bit, little bit, nothing at all, big bit, but no skills. You know, there's so many different dynamics to work with that everyone's experience can be different. So you can go to these high demand groups 
and you are pushed to your limits, but it's highly transformative. And for others, it can be deeply triggering. And for some of those for it's highly transformative, they can go years later and start to see that actually what was done to them was unhealthy, unhelpful or, or abusive. And there's no way really to, there's no place to manage that in this country. You can't go along mm. to the police and say, I, you know what I mean? What are they going to say to you? This is so problematic. And unfortunately, the more serious high demand groups and cult groups out there, they know this. They know the loopholes. They know that they can operate in these gray areas where there is very little chance that they're going to get prosecuted if there's not a critical mass of voice, which is what mm -hmm. I believe things like the group can mm -hmm. start to come. And, there's, and this is one of many groups. There's heaps online of people yeah. doing this stuff. It does feel like, I mean, maybe it's because it's the waters I swim in as well, but it does feel like it's really exploded in the last few years, this awareness or understanding. Um, can we define the word cult? Let's, you know, backtrack a little bit. Yeah. Do you have a definition? Yeah. Like when you use the word, what do you mean by it? Because it, it's um, getting thrown around a lot. Everywhere. Okay. It's probably easy to stick with the phrase high demand groups. I'm afraid I don't have access to my scholarly articles that defines cult, but usually there's some, but I can definitely give you some to pop in the show notes and there's some yeah. good like actual stuff that's in the academic literature that's looked a lot of this a lot about this but generally and add to this because you might know some stuff too if you cannot um if you cannot uh, question the leader on what they're doing you know and how they're doing things if that that's definitely a big fat red flag if mm -hmm. there's no if they if they uh, are not open to um how they're running things and how things that might be construed big red flag often there's a commitment to join these groups so you might be a, a, a payment or it might be giving up things or um you know or a period of time away from your communities um i mean we go on retreats right they're not cult, you know yeah. most of them are not cult so but um and but the um others and there's other things like um if you are slowly encouraged to um disconnect from your your life outside of that group if if someone is promising you that this is a path to liberation and all your you know you will be transformed through this process that's also a big who, I think who, who's I right? think I do that well this is it but, <laughs> but are you but you know you're are you also you know unquestionable and you know what I mean that, that, yes I, mean, I get it it's like it's like a, all of them coming <laughs> together you know because I'm like this is like what I teach is a path to liberation but I can't guarantee results at all yeah, you yeah, know yeah. there's no guaranteeing of results it depends yeah. on the individuals yeah yeah, yeah. Stuff. No, so no this is yeah. I totally get it and and this is why we're in such great territory because you know yeah. by definition work lots of workplaces are cults by definition every religion as a cult you know so maybe yeah. i'll speak to high demand groups because um that makes it a little bit um more vague for good reasons because mm. groups can also and the power dynamic you know groups can slip into healthy groups can slip into very unhealthy cult-like dynamics if the people in charge are not able basically essentially to hold on to their egos and keep them in check you know mm -hmm. when you when we're given a lot of power this is can be uh yeah very dangerous you know yeah very dangerous. yeah so and power then, dynamics like yes can we talk about that because that's something yes. that you've you've gone and you've studied right yeah Na yes nature so, of power dynamics yes and it, it's it's absolutely fascinating so um i will put it out there that i'm a raging marxist feminist um, i don't need to explain what that is but some people go oh yeah okay got it um so basically that well we'll explain a little bit um our society benefits from the unpaid labor of women. And then inside yes. of that, um, you know, women of color, even worse treatment, and then women, queer women, and, and people not able-bodied or trans and all that, you know, so it goes kind of down in layers. Um, but in, in social work, we're very much interested in power dynamics. So a lot of my masters was um, everything from what is power, because you can't- yeah. It what is, is power exactly right it's it's power is the re, to measure power you're measuring the result of something it is not a thing in itself you can't mm. you can't measure power like you measure height or weight or mm. even happiness right mm. power is an abstract concept 
and mm-hmm. it is um, no one is born with power unless the environment around them supports it. Mm-hmm. So, so if someone like Prince Harry is born, he's yeah. born with a certain amount of power because the construct is giving him that power because of his, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. And then when we start to use power over others, that ceases to be power and moves to coercion. So mm. and that is a different thing altogether. Mm-hmm. So power is a tricky concept. I like the idea of empowerment but power on its own is kind of like money in the wrong hands. It's really dangerous, right? <laughs> I like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, because it does, it can feed an awful lot of ego. It can be abused and without the right checks and balances, um, uh, we almost don't know how much we wield our power. I have power just by being an able-bodied white person when I go to a wins place if I needed to get social security for those of you outside of the country. I'm more likely to be treated better. Same when I go to the doctors, same when I apply for a job and all this stuff is in the stats. I'm not making it up. It's it's all out there in our data anyway. Mm -hmm. But um, For the power thing, um, just some reflection, like what I notice is like, I feel like I'm more empowered now. Like, and it feels like it comes from not caring what the people around me think. And Mm -hmm. I notice that if I'm interacting with someone like a guy that I want to impress or whatever, what I notice is that I, my sense of power diminishes. Like I I can sense that in some subtle way, it's a status thing in a way. It's like, I'm giving it away. Feeling thing, right? Yeah. yeah and just noticing that and you're right it's, it's nebulous it's like what is going on there with that um so how do we how do we be aware of power and work with it in a healthy way like if someone's a participant and or a facilitator in an event mm. yeah like yeah what to watch out for or what to be aware of okay so if we go back to the idea that power is socially constructed as in Mm -hmm. we have power because of the way so i'll backtrack a bit very uh quite early in sociological thoughts i love sociology and this is not the only three types of leader but there was this guy called um webb and weber and a a german sociologist who's very influential he said there were three types of leaders out there you got the charismatic leader So you might, um, I don't know, Bob Marley was a very charismatic leader. Adolf Hitler was a very charismatic leader. Obama is a very charismatic leader. You've got leaders that are there by, um, because they've been voted in by some sort of law. So that's your presidents and your, you know, things like that. And then you've got, um, so it's charismatic leaders and then leaders who are born into it. So kings and queens right or, or lineages where people are you know sons of of, of gurus whatever mm-hmm. and they're passed down that lineage so there are many other types of leaders out there but if you imagine that all those three are can be socially constructed the charismatic leader is the interesting one because they have persuaded people to um to follow them or to um you know to to join their clan or agree with them or whatever and you get a lot of that in high demand groups where people don't necessarily have they haven't been given spiritual teachings passed down from them from their grandparents or their fucker papa or whatever it is which is the Māori term for ancestry but you know the indigenous ancestry or you know they they haven't done a you know that they may have done some study but translating academia as we well know into the spiritual world is very sort of messy um you know they've often just become it because they are charismatic they've been able to think of a great idea and sell it or think of or or follow it or really really vibe with the spiritual path and sell it so this is an interesting power one because they get it by sort of sucking it out of the environment commanding it from others they're not Mm -hmm. no one's gifted them they didn't get voted in to be a spiritual leader they became it Bikram Chowdhury is a great one I mean he was a complete fraud right (laughs) you know Mm. he he, he wasn't well the practice itself was pretty amazing I did a lot of Bikram over about 10 years and it was so beneficial for my system yeah Yeah, but he he doesn't have any level of self-awareness or awakening yeah No. no 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 and um he's highly narcissistic toxic horrible 
And, um, and when I use the word narcissistic, I am talking very much on that psychological spectrum. So um, it, I, there's a lot I dislike about our modern mental health services, but there are some framings of personality descriptors that are quite useful. Narcissism mm -hmm. is useful because it can be on a scale. Like I have traits of narcissism and they've served me really well in my life. They've protected me from lots of bullshit. But if you get it too much and it's mm -hmm. coupled with the ego and that you don't care about other people and you're also, you're not open, you're not, you know, you're not um, empathetic and things like that, you know, that's when it starts to get really, really dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, so um, so when we're talking about power, it is socially constructed. Um, people will look to those in power and as you well know, will look at all of the signals. So it's not just what yeah. someone is saying. It's not just how someone looks. It's who they associate with. Mm -hmm. It's who they, um, how they present themselves, their public face, you know, mm -hmm. um, and whether if anyone knows anything about their private face and their public face, how similar or different they are. And there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with having them to be quite separate because we all need to protect ourselves, right? And particularly if you're mm -hmm. more and more in the public sphere, you need to have that private face as well. But um, being socially constructed, these cues are all very much absorbed and sometimes consciously or sometimes quite subconsciously by those around us. So where do you want to go with this there's many ways Ask yeah so questions. so what I'm curious right because I know that a lot of facilitators presenters and you know leaders listen to this podcast as well as participants so for someone like my, using myself as an example like I guess I mean I'm not um I have no lineage per se necessarily yeah. with the teaching I'm doing so what do I need to be aware of what do I how do I need to check myself what are the red flags I need to look at internally to make sure that I'm not unconsciously abusing power, you yeah. know? Okay, so I would very much, because you are in a position of power, you have a following, yeah. you've done an awful lot of study, um, you followed some really big teachers in your time, you have done a lot of trainings, you've got a lot of on the ground experience, you've got that lived experience. So you are in, definitely in a position of, um, you know, you are in a position of power and you are yeah. in a position of influence. And Aotearoa, New Zealand is, is small, really, at the end of the day. Tiny. It's, <laughs> it's, minute. <laughs> it's minute. So the pool is small, you know, that yeah. you are, you are, you, you know, you, it's not hard to get, um, it's not hard to be recognized or get a name, you know. Mm. Um, I think, and we do live, I mean, as you would have discovered, I've got zero social media presence apart from like a few, so I'm very kind of low key with that, but this is, it's not my job. I don't need to be yeah. in that space, but if you are in that space, your social media presence is incredibly important um, in terms of, because that's how people will relate to you when they can't mm. see you or face to face, or they can't um, come on your trainings or catch up with you at festivals, they will log in and, and see what you're doing online. So I guess my um, things to you would be, so I have also done quite a lot of research. Um, I write journal articles for, you know, you know, do research stuff with data and things like that, mainly in the social sciences. Um, and there's this one thing I do called thematic analysis. And I love it because it's very, uh, it can be quite boring, but after a while it becomes very intuitive. So you can, you basically take a, a long load of someone's you can take a bunch of transcribes from interviews. You can take um, news articles, headlines, all that kind of stuff. You can take any kind of period of time block of information from a group of people, one person, whatever. And then you start to see the themes emerging. So um, we all go through trends and we can, you know, hone in on various different things. But if you start to see themes emerging of generally there are more this kind of person being interviewed versus that person or this is talked about more than that, you know, that is all, although you can do the research behind it to sort of back it up with, you know, stats and data and stuff, generally people kind of get this vibe anyway. It, we, mm -hmm. we do take it in. I think it's really, really important being New Zealand, being a small place of who you're associated with and who you're affiliated mm -hmm. with. If you, if we're talking, so we'll dive right in now to the, um, you know, the culty conversations and mm. there have been, you know, posts in that group around, you um, uh, these high demand uh, 
what would you like to call them conscious sex communities or con- yeah like Esther and Haydn Haydn and things like that yeah when you and there's been a lot of discussion there and then that sent me off a million rabbit holes across the web finding like stuff everywhere about them so that they're, they're very kind of like relevant now um if you're looking at stuff like that if I know that you wanted to do a panel at the recent Haydn festival, correct? Yeah. Well, they, they invited me. They were like, we're going to do a panel. Would you like to be on the panel? Yeah. Okay. So you, you that's right. So you were invited to Haydn for the panel. So let me just pose a little story for you just to illustrate um, the point I want to make. Say if you worked at a workplace and it was really fucking horrible. The bosses were just assholes. It was just nasty. I'm not saying this is Haydn, not at all. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, this is just a, an exaggerated example. The, um, and, the, and the workers in the workplace are feeling unsafe, unhappy. Some are getting quite nervous about coming to work. So they're just over it. And some are getting really unhappy. They go to the bosses and the bosses say, there's nothing wrong, nothing to see here. I don't know what your problem is. You know, this is maybe the problems with you. And then after a while, a few more people go and a few more people go until there's that critical voice, right? Of people saying, there is a problem here. And mm-hmm. the bosses say, right, okay, we'll get, okay, we've heard it, everybody gather, we've heard it, we're going to address these issues, we will get a mediator in to discuss these, discuss what's going on. And for a moment, there's a bit of, maybe a bit of relief that from the workers they've been heard. And the day of the mediation, Everyone in the workforce sees the bosses taking the mediators out for a lunch. They're slapping backs. They put on a great spread for them. They're having a good time. They're, you know, talking really well, seem to be really pally. And then, right, everybody, let's go into mediation. You've already silenced a whole bunch of people who will no longer feel confident that that mediator is not going to have biases. This or or have or or be in some way there's still a power dynamic there because when you're invited in to mediate, you are in uh, you've been chosen for some reason you know you've put, whether it's your skills or whatever like that um, or your connections or your experiences whatever so there is the power dynamic between the mediators and the people who've are, who've called in for mediation and then underneath that is the people who have quote unquote grievance I don't like to use that word but just for the sake of this illustration that's you know they have the grievance there um but if you if that mediator is see is seen in any way affiliated in any way to mm. people that the grievance is against it's already void and it can't be done and I've seen this time and time again it does not take away from the motivation or the desire of that mediator to do good that the power structures that exist around that mediator are now void because they have been seen by others to be affiliated with the people who have um, asked them to do the mediation not the ones that have um, had the grievance in the first place so the people wouldn't trust that the mediator it that would never fly in social work just wouldn't wouldn't fly in the courts wouldn't work it would be instant if a if a judge was to see something like that the mediation would be rubbished because they're already mm-hmm. seen as a conflict of interest mm-hmm. um, there's this amazing black activist and social rights feminist called Audrey Lord and you may have heard her quotes very famous the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house mm, I have I heard that quote it. yeah and so, yeah. It, and we've seen, I've seen it in my work with big organizations with systemic issues that are trying to sort themselves out. They are tying themselves up in knots, despite the fact that there's many good people in some of these organizations. I'm talking about mm-hmm. our care and protection services or social welfare, that sort of thing. Despite some very good people in there, the structures have already been set up. And remember, with power structures, so much is unwritten it's a uh, culture it's uh, it's it's been set in stone it's like when you go back to your old school for a school reunion and you instantly feel like you're back at school again like you were 15 you know that stuff is very very um hard to shift and can't re- it's very hard to do from the inside mm-hmm. People- so going back to your point in terms of things to be aware of what you're saying is that associating with people that other people have assumptions about etc or whatever's going on then creates certain things yeah and and if you have you know affiliated teachers who have been implicated in stuff regardless of whether it's true or not that voice is getting loud enough to start to discredit you in want, wanting to do that work um 
it doesn't matter whether the allegations are true or not, mud sticks, and until that process is seen through for those people, then you will be tainted in that space. By and people's I, assumptions and projections, just to be clear. Because it, if you see what I mean, like... Yeah, see, if I was from a social work point of view, you have to take the voice of the quote-unquote victim. Mm -hmm. If they... If someone is saying abuses have occurred, whether it's sexual, physical, spiritual, or emotional, that has to be seen through and understood. And I'm not talking about that. I mean, yeah. I wasn't talking about projections or assumptions around yeah, that yeah. at all. I mean, in yeah. terms of like, I was invited to present at yeah. Biden yeah. and I was really curious to see what it felt like to basically find out for myself what it was like. Um, yeah. And so I said, yes, because I, I want to have direct experience. I, I won't make up my mind about something based on hearsay or, or secondhand information, et cetera. So I want to feel it myself. So I, I went. Yeah. No. And I, then I mean, people went. So what I'm saying is that because I went, then people have it make assumptions or or project onto me based on my decision to go. You see. I think um, because it was framed that you were going to be um, invited to talk on a panel that was going to address these issues, right? Yes. That, that came second, by the way. Yeah, they invited okay. me to come and present my own body of work. And then they were like, oh, if you're going to be there, let's do a panel on this stuff. Do you, do you think they were trying to model this on the Easter Shadows panel in 2021? Did you hear I that? don't know. I don't know anything about that, that particular panel. Oh, mm -hmm. I, I think I have heard of it briefly. Mm, that was where Rex McCann, I don't know Easter, I have nothing to do with them, never met anyone from Easter, but I've done a lot of reading and stuff online yeah. and verified sources through, you know, um, the stuff that's come out in the press, where Rex McCann said he had zero tolerance for vic victim consciousness. And it was a panel of people, um, basically leaders in Easter, saying, um, you know, I don't know what they were saying, but that was one of the quotes from it that's yeah. been taken out. And, you know, it's... If, if, if Hyde in any way were trying to replicate a model that ISTA had, because I know there's close ties between them, although they're different organisations, yeah. they've already discredited themselves of ever being able to hold um, space for, um, for people who have felt they've been abused or have been abused. Yeah. There is a difference between victim consciousness and someone who's been a victim of a circumstance if you yeah. if, if, if you're right that doesn't mean that you'd necessarily have victim consciousness in the slightest you're a victim of rape hmm. so there is a subtle nuance in there I don't know what Rex was referring to and that is a very good way of gaslighting and yeah. deflecting is yeah. to say victim consciousness without acknowledging the fact that if something happens like rape for example there is a victim and there is a perpetrator yeah and exactly and I think he has no right to ascribe someone's journey, whether they have to go through victim consciousness for ages yes. until they, yes, uh, you know. So I um, totally I, agree. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is this is quite, uh, yeah. This is it's tricky, you know. It's it's yeah. clearly you know gaslight, and and you know I really, I ha I mean when I've worked closely with particularly women who've suffered some quite serious, um, you know, sexual violence. Um, I have no, all I'm doing is walking with them on their path. I have yeah. no, I cannot, you know, if, if, unless they're really harming themselves through their pain, then I have a duty of care to them or harming someone else mm -hmm. through their pain. It is never for me to suggest how their healing journey should go. And this is another issue. With That's the a really important point. Yeah, I think this is what I've sensed or felt is that when things are agenda led, hmm. right? When there's an agenda in terms of we are going to make you transform, hmm. then it's a, it's about being, you know, being the ones that are controlling or leading the journey to get someone somewhere rather than what you're talking about, which is walking alongside and letting that person dictate where they go with their healing of, of their journey of healing and transformation. And I think that piece, is critical it is and it takes it's it's very tricky in conscious communities if they do have this ideology and it is an ideology that we yeah. are all one you know and 
there can be a need to hurry that victim, I don't want to use the word victim, hurry that person's journey along so that they have reached that place of healing. And it could be very well intentioned, but that is um, further damaging to that yeah. healing journey. Um, and also, how do you deal with um, perpetrators in that space? You can't. Mm -hmm. You just can't, they, they, they cannot be in that space. So therefore you need to start unpacking what it means to be all one, you know, and you know, it's, it's, it's tricky stuff. And there isn't, there is a, you know, there's not a lot, well, there's, there's, there's a lack of very practical, boring training in these socials, in these groups, consciousness groups on things like managing, um, mediation or disagreements or things like that or grievances or even sexual harm things like that there's there's a lack of and trauma trauma is a word that's bandied around all the time there's heaps of trauma trainings and i've watched the whitewashing of trauma you know and how it's just you know and it's done everywhere it's not just conscious communities like the western world has singularly looked at just trauma that happens in a window of time versus intergenerational in order to not to not have to acknowledge the stuff that that you know capitalism and colonization has done to you know half the world really um and when we're starting to talk about being trauma informed i think we're still really at the tip of the iceberg in terms of our understanding um, yeah. and i think it's very hard for those who haven't suffered with chronic PTSD or PTSD to really uncomprehend what it's like. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> right. Yes. It's very, yeah. Mm. It's a tricky one, but I, I do think for you, you need to look carefully at who your alliances and affiliations are. Cause when I look at your um, body of, of interviews and things over time, mm -hmm. you um, there, there are, people platformed or, or not platforms on the way you've interviewed people that have been caught up in a lot of this stuff or mm -hmm. affiliated with a lot of this stuff more often than you've had survivors talking about it although i'm seeing some yes. of that stuff coming through yes um, you have a teacher that is implicated in a lot of stuff out there and i have no idea who he is and i don't care to i oh, just i do D dane thomas he is oh he is he's not a, he's up. not a teacher of mine oh so he you um he called i you work i work with him but i see him as a colleague um because oh, he called you a client yeah well i do i'm i in his containers hmm. um but so yes yeah, so that's the interesting thing with power dynamic like i look and I, I i i do learn from him so you're right i could call him a teacher but when you said that i was thinking of my teacher and i'm like is he? Oh yeah, my no, God, no, what's no. going on there? <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. Um, and it is, you know, people will look to who you're associated with. Yeah. And then the stuff around um, narco coming to NZ Spirit Fest, highly problematic. I don't give but, a okay, shit. Okay, so this stuff, this um, is what is interesting, oh. right? So yes, I have worked with Dane and I've yeah. been involved massively in the conversations about whether or not to bring narco. And if we do bring narco, what do we do, et cetera. There's so much that goes on in the background around all of this that isn't necessarily communicated publicly because of confidentiality and also time constraints etc cetera, etc cetera. there's a lot of weighing up and feeling into like none of these are decisions are taken lightly and there is a part of me too that I'm not here to let me just feel into this it's like I'm the, the the part that's like I'm not concerned what people think I'm on this path and I'm trusting my intuition deeply and I'm trusting where I'm guided and what I'm doing and it's not to... and I guess I can see how it might look on the outside and the the piece on the victims as well I have interviewed some at least one person but when we did the interview I made the call to not post it because I felt like it would actually do her a disservice and put her into yeah and Good so I made yeah Good and on. I made that call because I was just like oh I just feel like this is not the right thing to do because I do want to share those stories but it's very challenging material to work with in a way that doesn't put the person in further harm as such I, t I totally understand and I think a part of someone's healing journey can very much be about coming out and yeah. talking about it. But sometimes in that healing journey, our wounds are still red raw. 
we yeah. just don't realize it and it, I, yeah. I, I do understand that but I think in terms of the narco stuff that was very recent what he had been accused of and he's been accused of multiple stuff mm-hmm. so by multiple people in multiple parts of the world again it's that critical voice the choice mm-hmm. of NZ spirit fest to bring him is very very telling in terms of how they the seriousness in which they take allegations whether true or not out there and how it reflects on their brand because they are a brand Mm. and that is interesting because to me but see I know what's gone on in the background in terms of how much research they did how many conversations they had on all of that to finally come to that decision so why did they choose to be the ones to save him Yeah, I mean that that's a good question, right? Like when I my my sense of it was that I don't know, it might be too, you know, like I wasn't and, yeah, and but I also know the due diligence that has been done around it. But, but even that is problematic because if it can't be public knowledge, then there's still some harm somewhere. <laughs> you know, whether it's to narco or to people that are potentially being silenced by him or who have been whatever I don't know I have no idea but well, I don't think anyone, yeah that it can't be that due diligence isn't open and public is problematic because everyone's just well, not everyone but it does it's a bit well, of they're a running thing. a panel they're running a panel at the festival called cancellation or conversations that they're bringing people in to and this is yeah you know and because this, to, to have the conversation and this goes back to how much do you allow space for people who've been accused of abuses yeah yeah no I, I totally get that so and I, I'm a, like I said I'm really aware of that in terms of talking to the person who's done the thing or talking to the person who's had the thing done to them and it's often like I notice that in my own tenancy it's like I want to talk to the person who's done the thing to find out what's going on and da 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 but what about the person the people on the other side and how to give them airtime but then we're back to that point again around if it's not necessarily beneficial for them to have that airtime, but how do you make sure their voices are heard? I, I think there are, okay, two things I want to talk to respond to that. One, there are ways you can get voices heard. You can do anonymous interviews. You can just do voices. You can do snippets. Yeah. You can, do, you know, there are many ways you can do that. Um, secondly, back to the power dynamic, people abuse, and I'm not saying, this is just, okay, people abuse, I'm not talking about anyone that we've mentioned now, but just in general, people abuse because they believe they have the power to do it. Going in to ask them and unpack with them why is simply buying into them having more power. It just is. Mm. Like the, when people feel they can take from someone, mm-hmm. whatever it is, their their dignity, their, their livelihood, their charisma, their vibrancy, their heart, their soul, their money, their virginity, their whatever, right? When people mm-hmm. feel it's their right to take and that that balances out because they're using the fact that they might be have a higher social standing, they're a facilitator or they're a mm-hmm. musician or they're good mm-hmm. looking or, you know, when they're taking knowing that they that that person is, is just going to give it up because you've got the power, mm. why would... That, that, that's that's their modus operandi that's how they work they work by just sapping energy out of people you know that's just mm-hmm. how they work mm-hmm. giving people space to unpack their um uh abuses or 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 indiscretions or transgressions whatever you want to call it is not is further giving them more power it just is mm. it just is mm. even if they're so what about if they've done the work if they've done the work and are coming back around, like, because I heard what you said earlier in the piece that you've worked with perpetrators and some of those perpetrators really don't give a fuck about anything mm-hmm. and will use, use whatever's going on as just another way to manipulate. Mm-hmm. Have you encountered and worked with perpetrators that do want to shift and change or that do? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have. I absolutely have. And what I've, and, and there's just been two people I've worked with who were very violent and abusive fathers and partners who changed. And there were some, there was a common factor between these two. So this is anecdotal only, this is not in the literature. They, um, one, radically changed their lives 
like radically, whether it was a geographical, changed careers, changed jobs, whatever. And two, they kept an incredibly low profile. Mm. They had their support networks around them. One of them was quite unsupported, but he still amazingly managed to completely radically change his life when he had... Mm. You know, I, I couldn't quite believe. I was so impressed with this guy, and he was, you know, the the the. You, you wouldn't even want to talk to him on the street. You know, he just just looks. Bless his heart, he looks a mess. Still does, but he has radically changed his life for for his children, and um and, but that they, they 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 did not go back into the same circles doing the same thing. They just mm -hmm. didn't. Very mm -hmm. similar to people cleaning up from addiction very hard once you've kicked your habit to go back into the environment yeah. that you were in before because again that yeah. power dynamic people treat you a certain way yeah also the other side mud sticks so a lot of these people these two people I work with wanted to keep an incredibly low profile and knew that only time could prove that they had changed when they hadn't been arrested, they hadn't been beating up anyone, they'd held down a job or they'd be, look, you know, renovated their house or had a relationship that was stable, but they kept an absolute low profile. And both of them cha completely changed. One wasn't working, one, the other one completely changed his career, had to completely get out. Yeah. So I do, I, I don't, there's, it's harder for success in changing when you step straight back into the same environment after a six month, 12 month break. Mm -hmm. it's just really hard because again not just power socially constructed but people have a view and idea of you and will treat you in a certain way it takes a yeah. very long time for that to, to shift and change yeah it, and it only takes a couple of mishaps for it to stick in someone's mind mm -hmm. but I think going back to all these high demand groups what's critical here is that critical voice is growing as a mass of voices now in all this stuff. And I think, you know, brought on from mm. the unit. So places like Haydn and ISTA, they, I'm pretty sure more stuff is going to come out and it's going to not be great, you know, because people are getting, you know, and, and of course, every, in all those situations, you will get people who are lying, you will get people who are exaggerating, but that cannot detract from the harm that has been caused. It cannot detract from, the difficulties that have been there and it cannot detract from the fallacy of thinking you can fix it from the inside so I don't how do you fix it as an organization if this stuff has gone on what would you like to see from an organization such as ISTA or or Haydn when there's been all of this do you think it's possible for there to be I'll a move, shift I'll move Haydn out of it because I yep. think it's run by raging like dangerous narcissists <laughs> Like I absolutely think it's it, you know these are serial abusers and they they don't fly under the radar with that they're quite open about it. So looking at the smaller, if you say if you wanted mediation, it's very very tricky, right? Because you're going to have to um, it's going to have to be someone completely outside, not not affiliated at all in any way, shape, or form with victim or um, perpetrators or whatever, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Paid mediation is expensive. Mm -hmm. It's likely the results would completely dismantle the business model. Hmm. It, you know, it's likely that the results would also um, mean it's not tenable to have those people coming now to the courses, you know. So, so this is a direct threat to a livelihood. So there's much more at stake than just silencing victims or, or, or quietening things or, or mm. hoping that we all get better and heal together. There's a lot more at stake than that because this country is so small. Mm -hmm. um, I, it, it has a reputation. Now these places have reputations. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if many people who just utterly swear by the power of the transformation they had there, I wouldn't be surprised if some of them in the future go on and go, actually, that wasn't okay. This happened to all of us, right? We've all been in that relationship or that situation where someone treated us bad at work and it was kind of okay at the time. And then years later, you're like, that was fucked up. <laughs> you know, it's just- yeah. But so when that happens for me, yeah. Right, what I because it has happened to me, but I don't care about the person who did. I what I go is like, where was I at? 
What was mm -hmm. running in me? How did I allow that to happen? What in me needs to heal so that doesn't happen again? Now, I get that I have a lot of privilege in terms of a lot of practice, a lot of time on the mat and the cushion, et cetera, high level of self-awareness and an ability to shift and change things. But that's the way I tend to orientate is that when I realize that things happened in the past that at the time I didn't realize were problematic, I do the inner work around it so that that shit don't happen no more. Why do you think you let it happen? Why did you say that? Why did I let it happen? Yeah, you said so. Why? Yeah, you said why did I let it happen? That was one of the questions. Yeah, because yourself. why do you think you let it happen? Because if I had acted differently, it wouldn't have happened. So are you blaming yourself? Not at all. I'm just saying that I'm taking responsibility from the perspective that if I'd acted differently, it wouldn't have happened. I can't change people outside of me. I can't change the circumstances per se. What I do have control over is how I show up in situations and recognizing that in the past, because of my trauma, I had a tendency towards fawn, right? But I didn't understand that. I didn't know what that was about. I thought it was things were a yes for me when it wasn't. It was a fawn because I felt unsafe. So now that I can see that, and do the work around it, then I can go, oh, that's not going to happen again because I've shifted and changed. So that there will stop people wanting to talk to you about having experienced abuse. Might not stop everyone, but it'll certainly stop some people. Yeah. That, that will, it will absolutely silence people. You're working from a deficit model, assuming that you had some agency in this. And I think that's not... So that, what do you mean by assuming I had agency? Are you saying I don't have agency? No, no, you're saying as in you said to me, I could have, I, I, I thought about that and if I'd behaved differently, the thing would have happened. That's what you yeah. said. Yeah. Victim blaming. That's called victim blaming. That's very, I just very don't see... Yes, yeah, I, I love this point. I love what you're bringing up, Sophia, and I love that you're pointing it out to mm. me. Um, mm. because from my perspective, it feels like I'm just taking radical self-responsibility that brings me into a place of being able to work with my internals and not let that shit happen again. Do you believe we're all born equal? No, everyone's got completely different conditioning and karma in situations. So how can it be? So you have a privilege of being able to take responsibility for yourself. Is that what you're saying? I, I yeah, because of the work I've done in the yoga, et cetera, et cetera, I feel like, yeah, it's quite likely there's a privilege there at play. So that would mean that someone else that had done lots and lots of yoga, but still ended up getting abused for somehow it was their fault. Not at all. But that's what it sounds like when you frame it like that for yourself. I, well, yeah, it does. I don't feel like it was my fault. I don't, I don't kind of work in the something paradigm of fault and blame. Okay. It's just something the arising of conditions at the time. That, yeah I, you know, I understand like, where you're coming from but I, yeah that is, that's a it's a harmful way of looking at it for other people and that would have to be your own journey to to resolve that if it's not resolved or but I, it, it is it is saying that at some point you had a deficit and it doesn't matter that you don't care about that that you've forgiven yourself for it but it's assuming the fault is with yourself or the, the, the um, way you behaved somehow caused that to happen. And that is a really, really problematic place to come if you want to work with people who have been abused. Some don't be, want to work with people that have been yeah. abused, or, or per, per se, you know. Or, or, or interview them or, or champion them or advocate for them or whatever. You're sounding mm. like you're more able to talk to the abusers than you are to the people that have suffered abuse or been abused. Mm. There's a lot, there's a... This is, yeah. This is, I can, I can feel how much there is in this. And I love that we just got, like, this is edgy stuff, <laughs> right? So the end and we just got into it. <laughs> well, we, you know, we can talk a little, you know, we can talk a little bit longer because... Um, That's good, I've got, I've got time. Yeah, because I think, I think this is important. Um, you know, I feel like I frame things in a particular way Yeah, it's interesting what you're asking. I do feel like it's my responsibility to set boundaries, right? Yeah. Adult, <laughs> adult to adult. Like obviously yeah. as, a, as a child, it's yeah. not my, you know, I can't set boundaries as an adult. And I can see how those boundaries get transgressed even when they're set. Mm. Um, you know, but I'm, I'm talking about situations where if I had set a boundary, 
the shit wouldn't have happened if I'd said things, you know, like it is. It, yeah. It's, and, and you, you have, you know, as you said, you, as you're getting older, you care less of what other people think and you're able to kind of say, so there's a, I'm sure the same with me as a part of me that goes, I made a fucking mistake. I don't care. You know, it's done, dusted, but many people don't come in to this world or the society is constructed around them that they, they just simply don't have access to that kind of ability to set those boundaries, whether that's being a toxic family environment, intergenerational trauma, long-term, you know, illnesses that have just worn you down, you know, yeah. run ragged by five kids. I don't care. You know, never had an orgasm and you feel in, in upset about it, you know, and anxious about it. You know, there's so many things that makes it not our fault that a, a, an abuser yeah. perpetrator can see the, the, can see that their way in that my friend. So this, one of my therapists told me many years ago, he, he, he won't mind me sharing the story. He, um, his boss um, helps to rehabilitate sex offenders, right? So, um, which is normal in, you know, therapy fields, the higher up you go, you're often doing some quite sort of, one of the jobs is we would take sex offenders into places where children would be nearby. Um, and this is a particular person who, sorry, trigger warning, everybody, trigger warning, everybody. This is someone who had offended in the past against children. So they're in the park. Trigger warning. This is not nice stuff, but it's not, um, it's something that was said, not done. So this uh, therapist said to the person he was rehabilitating to be out in the community, uh, they're in a park, there are children some distance away playing. The therapist said, um, and so who would you choose? Yeah. I mean, they, they do these kind of yes. very risky questions and questions. It's a part, you know, the ther- and the and the person said, can't you tell? Mm. And he said, no. And he said, well, that one and that one. And then he mm. said, and the therapist said, why? Um, and he said, because someone's already been there before. Mm. Yep. And it's like abusers. They're kind of, I don't want to liken them to bees because bees are amazing. But yeah. they, bees see colors we don't see. Yeah. Narcissistic people see vulnerabilities that are completely healthy and normal for us, but they'll come in. And they are often very, very clever and will see things that we haven't even thought of yet. So saying that I can adjust my behavior and that won't happen you wouldn't say that to a person walking home at three o'clock in the afternoon of being raped, right? No. You just wouldn't. <laughs> you just wouldn't. So, no, but I'm talking about a very specific thing that, yeah. that unfolded for me, you know? So it, it, it's within narrow parameters, right? It's still blaming, yeah. though. It's still on some level saying you could have done different. Well, I when- c- couldn't because of where I was with my conditioning, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what I'm, I'm recognizing that because of where I was at, that was part of what co-created the situation, but I'm not blaming myself. Mm. But, but then, but you can say exactly the same thing about going into a group Yoni massage session, <laughs> I you know, to, you know, to, to in, in a, in a, in one of the spiritual, uh, you know, communities, there's, you know, you can go in for a group Yoni massage where you're all together you know getting a massage you know saying that to someone outside of the communities who doesn't understand the social norms in those groups it's like well you know what were you doing you know no wonder this happened you know so the norms are different inside of these groups but it doesn't mean to say that people's boundaries shouldn't be transgressed and also totally. you know consent yeah. is a sliding scale these places not having um detail of exactly what's happening in each workshop yeah is very problematic and it is based on a therapy model of that sort of transformative therapies as kind of places that center point was really really into center point was a cult in this country bad one yes. um you know and it's you know these radical transformation group therapies com- therapeutic communities which are amazing and therapeutic communities um i you know this particular thing is used a lot in addiction circles and it's highly successful but without the proper training without the proper boundaries around mm-hmm. it 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 leaves i believe that it people who are keen to abuse or transgress are absolutely drawn to these places because they know they can do it there yeah they just do know there are certain yeah. 
it's like going to those dance groups and you know it's just full of sleazy people man you know they just all turn up there you know it's just or you know you go to a, a club or something you just know it's got a reputation for just being awful you know it's yeah like they, know, they know where these places are and there's no there's there, there's there's still not the proper kind of channels to manage it mm. so for participants in the conscious world who are mm. wanting to do potentially sexuality work for example yeah how what advice would you give or what suggestions would you give for people to keep themselves safe do your research and although social media and groups can be an absolute nightmare in terms of you know trolling or cancel or cancellation or whatever there's still an awful lot of good um resources out there through groups in reddit through facebook there is um i don't know if i can mention it it's a private group the tantra not trauma is a fantastic place to go for people to ask because there's just got i don't know seven thousand members globally you know they've, they've they've got there's a lot of people there that can give you um anecdotal advice um it is hard when it is anecdotal but mm. if if an organization has had some allegations around it and they've put stuff in place and there's still people upset, I would say, don't even bother with it. Like mm -hmm. if, if, because like I said, to change an organization from the inside is, is really, really difficult. It needs new people to come in to shake it up. You don't, you can't change radically change workforces in the, you know, this, the yeah. materialistic corporate world without, you know, someone usually coming in and, you know, carving it all up. It is really important. There are things like, um, I heard there was a consent workshop at Hyden. I heard, I mean, th that stuff needs to be practiced. I don't think you should be practicing it at a live gig. <laughs> you should mm. be doing pilot groups with people who are trauma informed and potentially therapists in there. So, you know, someone from counseling or social work who's got, you know, that background go and do pilot groups on how to do a, a consent workshop before you bring it into a festival you have every right to ask a festival or a or a circle or a group what are your procedures around consent how, how much um, information is given up front before you enter the workshop of what's involved mm -hmm. um, I understand pushing people to your edge you know I'm not going to tell you but right now we're doing this go you know and and mm -hmm. that's definitely a, a very much um, what ISTA does you know it's kind of baptism of fire again it does go back to very much like kind of like um, exorcisms you know but yeah. when we are dealing with trauma we have no idea what people can tolerate. And when we've given our power over in terms of we've paid the money, we promised this wonderful community, we promised liberation. These people around me are beautiful. I just want to be with them. I want to be like them. You know, it's mm. high stakes, that thought of being saying, no, I don't want this. And then ostracized from the room you know, or the group or even the whole thing. And you've just, you might've signed up for a few week course. I wouldn't, I'd I would be, very wary about going straight into a long course where there's mm -hmm. not a, an escape route you know mm. what if you find it's not for you find out if they will refund you some of the money if you decide to go on day three of a 20-day course you know like mm -hmm. that stuff is important um also um just social media stalk the facilitators it's no huh. harm doing it it's it, yeah. social media is there for a reason find out where they're at where they're edge what people are saying about them i do believe an awful lot of healing through amazing sex and sex workshops i think there's some amazing yeah. stuff like it is a huge source of our vitality and our drive passion and you know our life force and that's not something else I will say about mm -hmm. some of these so, um, sex consciousness. They very much cater towards the premenopausal woman, and that is un that is that is problematic, mm. it's, and that very problematic. Your sex does not stop when you're in menopause. <laughs> it, it is uh, it, it really and and I think that needs to be challenged. 
and you see it a lot in, in all sorts of, you know, sort of embodiment stuff. There's, it's run by women who aren't menopausal, right? <laughs> and then they suddenly get to the, you know, that stage of they're like, oh, holy fuck, I don't, you know, I didn't realize I was going to feel like this. Making it more inclusive for everyone's stages of life, I think is really, really important. How inclusive are they? How, and um, go, if you can have access to queer communities and things like that, what do they say about these? Any, anyone mm. from their communities been in there? It doesn't matter if you're going for something that's purely heterosexual and that's your jam but make sure that's what they say they are so mm. that they're not harming bi or trans or gay or whatever you know anyone from that community um also um yeah so i mean that that's it's kind of you know and, and get get on the facebook groups and do some reading and, and chat to people that have been on the courses before um there's lots of information about cults now to start looking in high demand groups as to what they are so yeah eyes and ears open remember we sometimes don't know we have trauma until it's triggered what <laughs> right i had no idea until yeah no. until it got yeah yeah and it was what? like oh my goodness I know, yeah. right? and 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 it goes in layers you know we yeah. think that was something and then it comes back again and again in very deep yeah. way what are their policies if you're having uh, you know a difficult session who is there what are their qualifications for you to unpack that with yeah it is awesome yeah, yeah. that's solid Sophia thank you so much for those recommendations and for the whole conversation thank um you. can just feel your depth of knowledge and I love the fact that you have been in lots of different worlds and have that broader perspective so thank yeah so if people want to join Colty Conversations it's on yeah. Facebook the yes. co-papa like just okay so it's not a survivors group everybody not a survivors group it's um nz culty conversations but we have all um all spectrums of people there we've got people who are basically moles we know that they're in high demand groups and they're in there just seeing what people are talking about we don't care we welcome them we've got people who are trying to get out of groups we've got people who are frightened about for loved ones who are in groups we've got people who are just curious about the groups and we've definitely got people who have got out and and change things around and then we've got you know I think there's a few therapists in there and a few journos and you know there's yeah. there's all sorts of people we um we don't uh condone any kind of like we don't ever want to turn the group into a witch hunt obviously when conversations like go off and the moderators aren't right on it sometimes things are slipped through but we're a friendly bunch so come and contact the moderators if you get in you will be asked some questions they are private the answers it is fascinating who gets into the group. It is fascinating. And it's not just for um, the spiritual, not religious movement. We've also got lots of people from Jehovah's Witness or, you know, other like Christian cults. So um, we've got all sorts of people in there and all age groups. And, you know, yeah, it's it's an interesting group. And then, of course, there's Tantra Not Trauma, which is another great yeah. resource. Yeah. That one's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. No worries. Ooh, hot damn, that was a conversation. Um, I just debriefed with Sophia a little bit and one of the points that she wanted to make that she didn't reference in the conversation was in terms of the working with perpetrators, she made the point that some perpetrators will often deliberately choose strong women who have their shit together and et cetera, et cetera, because they want to dismantle that woman they want to kind of tear her down so she said she's like oh, can you mention it somewhere it's really important to recognize that people who experience abuse it's not there's a wide range you know sometimes it's people who are more vulnerable or weaker and sometimes it's people that are really strong and have their shit together and everything in between nobody is exempt um, was what she was saying I feel like I need to have a bath and really contemplate all the things that Sophia brought up. I really loved how she picked up on my language when I said, I let it happen. And she was like, wait a second, you let it happen? And I get what she's pointing at. And I'm like, oh, is there a part of me that's still indoctrinated or is there something going on there for me? Or is it that, you know, because I do take radical self-responsibility for all that unfolds as a way to orientate to life because it makes me feel more powerful and it makes me feel as if then I have different experiences because I do the work around things. Now, that 
might still be true or it might even be that that's a construct that I need to look at. Um, so contemplating that. And you can see, you know, it's a really big conversation. I loved how she was quite direct with me in terms of be careful of who you associate, who you affiliate with, where you go. Because I did get quite a bit of kickback because I chose to say yes to Haydn. I chose to say yes to going to Eden Festival. And what she's saying in terms of the way that people who have been harmed by those organizations, those people might therefore see me and feel about me and interact with me. You know, I can I can sense that. But at the same time, I can sense that part of me that is like I wanted to have that direct experience so I could see and feel more of what's unfolding. Um, mm, and it is, it's like I feel like I walk in the in-between worlds. And one of the things Sophia said was that she felt like maybe I side more with the perpetrators than potentially make those who've been abused feel safe and that's a really interesting thing for me to contemplate because I experienced childhood abuse um, and you know quite a specific circumstances and I'm just wondering how that's conditioned me to perceive the abusers right things to contemplate thank you thank you thank you for listening to or potentially watching another conversation with Carolia that was Sophia de Fossard who is one of the admins for uh, NZ Culty Conversations a group you can find on Facebook I hope you got as much out of that one as I did and I will see you on the next conversation thanks for listening to conversations with Carolia and trust that you enjoyed that nuanced deep dive into spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. If you love my take on the spiritual path and you're looking for more insights like this, then make sure you subscribe and like. You can also check out my website, karaleah.com. That's K-A-R-A-L-E-A-H.com. And subscribe to my weekly newsletter.